All right, Jonathan, glad to have you back, man. Good to be talking with you. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing okay, despite everything, you know, trying to keep my head focused on what we need to do, but, you know, we're doing okay. All right, glad to hear it. Uh, you know, the last time that we talked, it was pretty chaotic here in the U.S. We had the intrusion of the Capitol. We had the GameStop scandal. Uh, and now a year later, uh, it seems like Canada is just going crazy, man. Like, what the heck is happening in Canada? Yeah, it is definitely going crazy. Our government, I mean, our prime minister is in trouble. Like, he, he is politically in trouble because he fueled massive division in our country. He started calling people who were... He started calling his political opponents basically racist, misogynist, a fringe minority. Uh, you know, uh, can we really tolerate these people? They're taking up space. Like he used really radical language. And so now there, there's a backlash. And also as other countries and, other, and even the provinces in the country are removing mandates, he's buckling down. He's just like, and not only buckling down, but invoking war measures, freezing people, freezing people's bank accounts, going all out. And so wow. it just, it, it's like, it's just, it's just very strange. And it's also because he's in trouble because he's, he's, it's a lose-lose situation for him right now. If he admits he was wrong and just decides to end the mandates like everybody else is ending the mandates, then his political career is going to wind down. And now if he, if he holds the line, maybe he can, he can push through like a big tough bully, uh, which could, could happen because people like bullies. So, you know, we'll see how that works out. They like bullies that are on their side. Let's say that. Yeah. So, I mean, like, what does that mean? Like for everyday people living in Canada, like yourself, I mean, like, what are you bracing? So for most for? people, it doesn't affect us in an in, in everyday manner because the provinces are lifting the mandates for now. And so like all the prop, most of the provinces are lifting the, the, um, the Vax pass mandate, which was preventing, like here in Quebec was preventing people from going to church preventing people from going to stores. And so the, their, the government is raising, is raising it for now. Like they're still gonna keep it, but at least there's gonna be some bre a breath of fresh air. Uh, it affects people who want to travel. So you're not allowed, if you're not vaccinated, you're not allowed to, or if you, do, if you refuse to, to use their passport, you're not allowed to take a plane. Um, and the government, the federal government has, um, has a, a they, they, they've said that they've tracked 33 million people during COVID through their app and through their, through their, through their cell phones. And so, so some people who are even that are vaccinated don't want to use their, their COVID app because it's just a tracking mechanism. And it's very disturbing to have the federal government track your every move like that. Um, but if you don't, then you can't travel. You can't take a plane. You can't, you can't take a train. Anything that cross, any public measure that crosses borders basically uh provincial borders wow but it's not like for most people it's not a big deal for truckers though it's a big deal because they can't they can't cross the border also and then work in the united states and come back mm -hmm. you know i was i was thinking about this there's two different design types right uh so there's like the hierarchy right where you have things that have order and you know but then you have another form of organization called networks right which is kind of like cross connecting and it can actually tie hierarchies and act at a different plane and i really i don't know maybe you can comment on this but i feel like truckers are on that network type where it's like they tie different provinces and states and borders and countries and they tie all of these different uh organizations together uh yet if they're not taken care of then all of these central structure or organizing systems uh, would fall apart. They're like the the fascia or something, fascia inside of the uh, connecting all of the different tissues inside the body. Yeah, definitely. The truckers are definitely the connector. That's why I kind of compared them to Saint Christopher. You know, they're 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 the psychopomp. They cross. That's what they do. They just cross things over from different different identities. That's what they do. And so you have to be careful when you poke at the sustaining network like the matrix itself people don't people don't realize you know because when we think of hierarchy we always think of hierarchy as if up good down bad but that's not how hierarchy works it's like up is identity and direction and purpose and all these things but below is something like that mesh right it's possibility it's the transference of possibility it's something like the the connectors between identities um, and that holds the world together. It's like a, it's basically like a frame that holds reality together. And you have to be very careful 
not to mess with that, you know, because it really is almost in a Marxist sense. I keep, I keep joking about it, but it's like it's the people, the people, the workers, the people below. You have to you have to afford for them to do what they want because they can actually freeze the world. They can stop things from moving, and if you things stop moving, then they die. So, so it's just interesting to watch, and that's the tactic that the truckers end up using. They you know they wanted to to close up roads. They wanted to block the borders. And so they're basically saying, we are the guarantors of this, of these trends, of these transmissions of things that move between spaces. And we also have the capacity to stop that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so, so it's just interesting. It's playing out symbolically in a very powerful way because it's all, and then, then the way in which the government reacts has to be an increase in, in order and tyranny in a way that yeah, in a way that is that that is the the downside or the dark side of hierarchy, you could say. Mm. Yeah, so it, it maybe like anatomically, it makes me think of the cardiovascular system or like the veins and the arteries that carry nutrients and information to all of the different systems or organs of the body, and like so it carries it all the way up to the head, right? So if a brain doesn't have enough uh, fluids and blood, right, then yeah then what is it going to do? It's going to be cut off. It won't be supported. No, you're right. And you can imagine, like, let's say the brain gives, or the brain, or the mind, I like mind better than brain, but let's say the, 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 the mind gives direction and the mind gives purpose and gives cohesion. But it, one of the things it has to do is it has to make sure that the lower elements, like you said, the, the arteries, the, the body, is, has what it needs to function. And if the, if the mind, let's say if the mind says, well, I, you know, it's like, I'm going to write a novel. I'm That's what I'm going to do. I just want to write a novel. Then you sit there and you sit at your computer for, you know, 78 hours or whatever. So, and you just write your novel. At some point, your body's going to say, well, you know what? It's not happening because I need to be taken care of. And if you don't take care of me, right. I am going to stop you from doing what you're doing. And I'm going to, you know, you won't get the energy you need to do what you're doing. You won't get the nutrients, like you said. Uh, and then you're going to, you can get annoyed as you want at your body, but that's just how it is, right? The body had needs, if it doesn't have what it needs, then it's going to, it's going to, it's going to clog up and that's how it end is. up in like an aneurysm. Exactly. <laughs> so we're no, but you're right. it's a it's, political it's, aneurysm, a political aneurysm. <laughs> well, like they're blocking all of the roadways, right? All these arterials, right. That are trying to yeah. make its way back to the center, right. To the capitals. Um, or try to connect the different major systems between different countries. Yeah, but and it was so really like the border, like the in. border, the border closings were the one that set everything off, like that set off the more political heat because one of the border crossings they crossed, which is the Windsor, the Windsor border crossing, I think they were saying that it's like, I think it's like 25% of all trade goes through that one bridge mm. from Canada to the US. And without the US, Canada just ceases to exist. Like, U.S. is the main partner for every kind of trade. Uh, you know, we're bas it's basically a porous, a porous relationship where things go back and forth nonstop. And so, if you stop that, you, Canada can't survive. So, yeah. Well, I don't know, Jonathan. Do you have any <laughs> other insights you want to share on that topic? Because about I that so stuff. Yeah. So just, uh, I guess like the overview is like, I really would like to get into palindromes, talk about God's dog. Uh, Let's do film, that. It's much arrival. more, it's much better right now. It's totally <laughs> fine. I, 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 just, I, I, I'm so stuck in this all, all day long that it's good to talk well, about something else. Well, I appreciate you addressing it, but um, there are some, some bright and positive and, and productive topics that we can uh, get into today. Uh, sure. So the palindromes, God's dog arrival, um, so I want to get into a few icons and just have you comment a little bit about them because I have some questions. One is sure. the Anastasis or the resurrection. Uh, another one with the burning bush and the Theotokos. Uh, and then I have some other kind of fun questions at the end, like uh, what your favorite movie is and why. Uh, and then uh, I have a, a collection of terms. I just want to make sure that I have a, an accurate grasp on it. So maybe we can come up with like a dictionary of the key symbolic language terms or something like sure. that. Okay. So with palindromes, um, so palindromes, it's, it's, it's something, whether it's numbers or letters, and it can be read front ways and, and back ways. Um, so in that, it kind of creates an interesting uh, design 
And so the title of your forthcoming graphic novel, God's Dog, is something that can be read forwards and backwards. I'm just wondering, like, what are the power of palindromes? And why did you go with one for the title of your book? Well, I think that for sure the God dog relationship is not one that we made up or that is actually particularly uh, innovative. You see it, you see it. People have tried to make plays on that, on that uh, relationship for a very long time. But, yeah. and I think that the, the idea of a, of a mirror, at least the way the palindrome works is that you have an order and then you have it upside down in the same word. So you have it. You have one meaning and then you have a word that is the opposite in terms of its of its meaning. Um, and that's what that's what made us more interested in that palindrome rather than something else, because some palindromes are maybe visually interesting. Um, and they're also interesting just because they are this opposite. But in our case, it really was something like the idea of a mirror where in a, in a certain matter, the the dog, the dog manifest everything that is related to the periphery, to the passions, to, to a kind of um, a lack of a lack of mind in itself, you know, but then also can act as the vehicle for mind, right, can act as the, the extension of body, the extension of all these things. So we like the idea of putting those really putting them together, and then that becoming an image for what the story is about, which is about this which is about, you know, a monstrous dog-headed monster who ultimately ends up carrying the logos. Um, and so how that works together. Uh, and Core did a really great job because it really is actually coming close to being, there's another, I forget what it's called. It's, it's not just a palindrome, but it's, it's also, it's, all, it's also, he made the, the, the lowercase g look like the uppercase g, but upside down. So you could actually flip it, almost flip it around and it would still read the same. There's another term for that. It's not just a uh, palindrome. There's like another. Uh, okay, I see what you're the, talking about. Yeah, there's another. Yeah, yeah. So if okay, he had just made the D like a little, uh, turn the D around, then it would have been completely like it, it would have been a word that you could flip over. Uh -huh. It would I'm always gonna, read the same. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at that. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. So you can see just the, if just the D was a little different, then we could have, we could have had a pretty uh, close. But I, I think it's great this way. It's cool. Yeah, yeah let's cool. see. No, you're right, man. That works. That's so cool. Okay, so yeah, yeah so like it's Im imagistically, you could like rotate it uh, and not just like see it, but read it as well, front ways, back ways, and then upside down. You could flip it that way too on the horizontal plane, as well as the vertical. Yeah, and so the the story that's the story is really about the. I mean, it's about a lot of the stuff that I talk about, a lot of stuff that Matthew talks about. You know, the whole problem let's say of the margin especially now because this is where we are in our society so trying to understand the difficulty that comes with with the marginal creature but then also the opportunities and, all, and the same for the other way around which is the, the the danger of the of authority but the opportunities that come with authority and so that play is the one that is is there during the whole during the whole story yeah. So, okay. The, it's interesting how you, you mentioned the opposites, how there's, it's like, maybe you, you, what you think is opposite is actually complementary. Is that, is that what's being played here? Or the thing that the, the very last thing that you thought would be opposing ends up being the thing that lifts up or completes. Like, for example, yeah, the, this like, is what... the, like, if you read God's dog, it's like, oh, well, you think there's the beginning of the word. Well, actually, the ending is the beginning mm. and vice versa. So it is. I mean, and I think that this is really completely in line with Matthew's idea of this double flip that he's kind of uncovered for us. And the notion of the gesture and the role of the upside down, understanding that there's something mysterious which happens at the end of the upside down, which is that the upside down uh, almost like returns normality back to itself. And you can understand it that way, which is that in a proper vision, the upside down is the last statement. It's the last statement of any meaning, which is that you have a hierarchy of meaning and saying the opposite of it is like the last thing in the frame in the, of that meaning because it still belongs to that frame, right? Because it is the upside down of something. Um, and so you can understand. So that's why the, the whole idea of the carnival as being the last moment in, in, some, in some cycle. And that's how it participates in extinct, let's say in finishing the cycle 
finishing one cycle, but then also rebooting the next one. So you can so you can think of any type of of let's say if you think of a carnival of a carnival gesture, which is for example the the, the boy bishop, which you see in England, for example, where they would they would elect a boy as the bishop for the day, and then a child would become the bishop. And it would be like this absurd situation. And then at the That's end it. of that, it's like in exposing the absurd part of the pattern, you actually are able to restart it somehow. Huh. Okay. Okay. So that reminds me too, there's a, who's, I think Peterson brought this up, but I also read it somewhere else where like the emperor is the lowest figure of mocking and they just parade him around and like strip him down naked and, you know, throw food and stuff on them and it's like the lowest of the low um like this would have been one day i think he was talking about in uh in the i think it was in the assyrian empire i think that he was talking about or the babylonian someone one of the one of the eastern empires where one day of a year they would humiliate the king right but in, in that sense it's kind of like interesting where it flips you know it's like the highest becomes the lowest and in fact i suppose we see this in christ Right. <laughs> right. Christ is the ultimate version of this, that, that pattern, you know, he really brings it to a limit that is, that is hard to, to over that can, can't really be, uh, there's no more virgin after his version, right? right? In his version, he, the, the crucifixion is so extreme in how it does that, that I don't see how you can, and it, we even, every time I talk about it, I just, my mind short circuits because I can't contain all the <laughs> yes. elements. Yes. I can't, I can't, I try to, and I'm like, I'm okay. So it's like, I'm like, okay, he's on the cross. There's a, there's a panel, which is saying that he's the King atop of his head, but they're actually mocking him. So it's sarcasm. I kept, I talked about this recently where sarcasm is part of the end of meaning because it's, you say something, but you mean the opposite of what you're saying. So it's like the last word because it's saying something, but, but understanding it while you're using a statement, you're actually saying the opposite. So right. like he has yeah. a sarcastic statement above his head, which is saying king, uh, king of the Jews. But then ultimately that sarcastic statement ends up flipping in the resurrection where he does manifest his kingship. And, and then you're like, you know, what, what? And then you also have a weird moment where the Romans put that up, right? Right. King of the Jews. Uh -huh. But then the uh -huh. Jews are saying, no, then Christ resurrected and he becomes king of the Romans. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. it just, if you keep going, because there's more, right? Just keep going. And at yeah, some yeah. point, it just shatters your whole category system. It's so, it's so, there's so much in there. Yeah. I, I keep trying to tell people, I'm like, yeah, like modern movies, like even the good ones, they're good. But like, when you approach the Bible in this manner, it's better. And it just gets better and better and better the closer you look to it. Because like, you learn something, right? It gives you like this platform of understanding and then you stand on that and look and reread it and you're like yeah, exactly. oh my gosh and then you read something else and you read something else you come back to it, you read it again from another platform and you can see further deeper more intricacies you know it's more hyper connected it's just yeah exciting i don't know it's yeah, it is it's exciting, exciting right? experience i mean it's meaningful like it's life you know it's not like some limo place where you're like you can't go to arkham you know and you know partake in the the batman universe like that's yeah. not possible uh, but you can go to Jerusalem, you know, yeah. you can go to Jericho, you can go to Egypt um, and you can participate in this story in, in a way that's like narratively unfathomably deep and profound. And at the same time, you get to like act it out and be a member yeah. in it, not like as a playtime, but actually like life. Really. life yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's pretty. It is definitely amazing. I mean, I'm excited also to see people realize it, like realize that, you know, there's been a sense in which we, there has been a sense in which a lot of the Christian message has been moral, which is fine, like a kind of moral idea, you know, Christ is saving you from your sins, is saving you from these moral failings that you have. And so there's an emotional, there's an emotional uh, healing, you maybe that you go through, you know, through that. But I'm just, I'm excited that people are also seeing that the actual narrative itself is so intense. Like there's so much in that story that you, you, like I said, as soon as you start thinking about it too much, you all of a sudden you short circuit, you have to kind of wait and then come back to it later and, and notice even more. So, yeah. Yeah. And you know, your brother's book, your work, 
Alistair Roberts. I mean, there's James Jordan's book, uh, Through New Eyes. Have you read through that one? Yep. Mm. So, I mean, like, uh, what these things have, like, just at least personally opened me up and many others to be able to read the biblical literature with such a, a profoundly holistic and engaging way. Like, I, like I was reading through the headlines and the, the outlines of the Gospels recently, and it just amazed me where it's like, you know, if I were to approach this as like, you say like my, from my California Buddhist days, like it's not that impressive, you know, like it doesn't list out these like head twisters or these like super simplified condensed, you know, sayings that really get you like, oh, wow, there's not a whole lot of that. And then like, narratively speaking, like on the surface level, it's like, it, it doesn't do a great job telling a story because it like blurts out the ending and there was the resolution all the time. <laughs> like especially in the gospel of luke it's like oh and the reason why he said that is because he's going to be killed <laughs> you're like oh well come on that's like taking the cliffhanger out of it um but then when you like take a step back read you know and watch your material your family's <laughs> material uh alistair roberts like so many others and all of a sudden you're like oh man and then and then you read the context from which it was unfolded or blossomed which was the old testament and you realize oh man, this is not just the climax of one story. This is like somehow, like miraculously, this is the climax of like 50 stories or a thousand yeah. stories yeah. all at once in history. Like, no, it's amazing. And you can, and, and uh, even in the text, there's a sense in which if, you, if you're attentive, you can notice that the disciples don't totally know what's going on. Even as it's happening, they're kind of have, they have this insight, but they don't have enough to fully put the puzzle pieces together. And then, and then when it's over and they, they, they receive the Holy spirit, all of a sudden it's as if it all just comes crashing in on them. Yeah. And they just kind of yeah. realize they have this insight about how it all connects together. I could just yeah. imagine Meaning them overload. having that, that like one momentary, cause they were with it, you know, and they saw these things and they were all kind of mysterious to them. They, they knew enough to say, well, there's something we need to follow him. Like there's something there. And then all of a sudden it hits them. Like, this is like, this is the end of the story of Moses, right? It's the end of the story of Adam. It's the end of, yeah. and it all kind it's of David, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the prophets. Yeah. You know, gosh, it's though. even the outsiders. The cool thing about, yeah. um, so like say Alistair Roberts book, uh, echoes of Exodus. So he takes all of the different role players, um, you know, so like even with, you know, Pharaoh, uh, the messianic type deliverer figure, um, the different symbols of crossing water. But the interesting thing is the role of women and then the role of the Gentile. And you see by the time of Acts, you take this outsider kind of on the fringe character. Yeah, Ethiopian eunuch flips. Oh man, yeah, that story, like, there's so much in there, yeah. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden it's like the main point is Rome. And you're like, oh man, the people that are off on the side, you know, they only got like a line or two, maybe, you know, or they're the bad guys the whole time through, you know, the Exodus story and through the Philistines and David and the, the um, restoration period or exile period. And all of a sudden, boom, like they're the whole point. And Paul is directing all of the attention towards. Uh, and if you, if Rome. you go outside of scripture and you continue the story, you realize that then when Rome converts, just what that means and what it is in terms of, this this reconciliation with uh, with Esau and in the gospel, like the relationship between Rome and Esau is there. People they struggle to see it because it's not super obvious. But Herod is an Edomite, and so Herod is a descendant of Esau, and he's and he's a a king that was placed by the Romans on the 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 Jewish state, but he wasn't a Jew. He was an outsider. I mean, he probably practiced a form of, of Judaism, but he was not, he was an, he was not in the, of the tribe. He was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau. And so, so like wow. for, you can understand that even in the first century, in the story of Jesus, there's a relationship between Rome and Edom in the story where it's like, they kind of fuse together as this character, like, you know, the, the kind of Cain figure that wants to kill his brother. Um, so anyways, yeah, it's pretty, it's just, it's pretty. And also because even later, the, the, the early rabbis, they made that connection explicitly. Like when they say, they talk about the kings of Edom in their own rabbinical text, they're talking about Rome, basically. Wow. So wow, wow. it's just really fascinating. Yeah. 
Well, just it, see, like it, the other thing that Roberts does that I feel like really helps me because I have a musical background mm. is that he says, like, if you approach literature of the Bible musically as like a controlling metaphor, then that helps you understand how the writers are playing upon different, call it movements, uh, you know, like different uh, plot structures and motifs. Yeah. So like whether it's symbols or uh, different patterns, con highly condensed patterns that you can see either stretched out or played with, kind of like how Hendrix would cover Dylan, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that, where there's, there's something recognizable in it, but then it's something unique all to its own. And just in your example, the fact that they're playing upon not just a few of the themes from Genesis, but like several of the different variations upon like, like say the, like how you said it in our last uh, conversation, Genesis one through three is like the pronouncement of the core pattern. Mm, and, yeah. and then you see all of its different variations uh, and expansions in Genesis. And so like in the gospels, it's just amazing how it's like the master conductor, how they're, they're, they're acknowledging, including all of these different themes within 20 chapters it's fascinating yeah and it's hard to, and it's hard and it's also done in a way that doesn't call attention to itself and i think that's why a lot of people um miss it because like the 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 style of the gospels is just so simple and straightforward mm -hmm. and there isn't a lot of the like you said for example like if you read some buddhist text and there's like this amazing uh you know contradiction that is so clearly stated as a Cohen that you that wants to kind of jar your thinking and stuff whereas Christ dissimulates the things he does in a very simple common uh story and and very simple common things and so it's sometimes so you can also have sympathy for people who don't necessarily can't see it because it's Christ himself tells us like it's like for some people this is just going to be veiled mm -hmm. it's going to it's going to appear as veiled and they won't understand what's going on um so so you can sympathize with people who are just like what is this this what is this story about this guy who like he gets killed by the you know he gets killed by the roman state you know uh by his own people and the romans and and it was like this is the foundation of a religion he said some good stuff but mm -hmm. you know that, so, but, I, that's that's a good point the, the sympathy aspect because when i was re reading it just like i mentioned before taking a step back right mm. and just kind of maybe having an exercise where I forgot all of the different ways of seeing that I've had the fortune to learn over the years and just like compare it as such to other books. And it's like, you know, it might be kind of gray, but then all of a sudden, you know, you have teachers come, right. Whether it's reading your books or, you know, priests or theologians or storytellers or someone inside. Right. And they, they hold up like a flashlight and it's like a blue light or something. And all of a sudden, all of the letters like come alive and you can see like different color patterns and uh, different uh, like ultraviolet. Like it just becomes something so much more, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it can happen to you even. So, so one of the, some things that sometimes what happens to me is there are some stories which are still on the back burner for me that I don't understand, like even in the gospel, but I, but I've had enough insight and insight moments in some of those stories to think, no, it's not the story. It's me. Like, that's for sure. Yeah, it's definitely yes, not the story. Yes. Right. Uh, but there are moments where, you know, I look at some detail in scripture and I'm like, what is this? Like, I don't know. I don't know. What is this? I don't, <laughs> yes. what, is, what, what, what is this talking about? Why is it such a big deal? Uh -huh. But then I usually like, I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave it and just continue on my life. And then sometimes out of the blue completely, you know, like it just, it's like a lightning bolt that hits me. And then when I see it again, I'm thinking, how could I not see this before? Yeah. Like, how is yes. it that I couldn't see this was what it was yeah, yeah. about? Yeah. And so, so then you're like, okay, well, that's, it's kind of like that for everybody, I guess. Uh -huh. And for a, a lot of people, because there are still some stories that, that, that when I look at them, I'm kind of like, nah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about that. I don't know what that means. Like, I don't know. Why is it that Christ is saying that? Or why is he doing that? So, yeah. I mean, like, uh, like in our last talk, you talked about, um, the donkey why does christ ride the donkey right another kind of odd story to me is like why go get the fish and find a coin in the mouth like what the heck was that talking about yeah right and then all of a sudden you go back and you read like the book of numbers or like first kings or chronicles or something and all of a sudden you you read some 
some detail in that story that all of a sudden just opens everything up to what's being told later, like thousand years, 2000 years later in the gospels, you're like, oh, you know, it's kind of like that musician that just has that lick and he knows just mm -hmm. the right time to put it in to acknowledge what happened before, but then make something new. But then the really interesting thing about the gospels is that it's really filling in the details of the end or the full mm. picture as yeah. well. Yeah. It's filling up the picture of the, like the kind of vision, the final vision of, of it all, you would say, no, you're right. So uh, a couple more things on that note. One, I want to share an image of the film arrival. Have you mm. watched the film? Yes. Okay. So uh, as you know, I was able to write, so far, one essay on arrival, pulling out the structure of the story is primarily leaning upon Exodus, you know, climbing the mountain and, and whatnot. But something that is really um, a predominant theme in the movie is the palindrome, right? And it's this like circular pattern where the beginning is the end. And we also see this palindrome in the naming of the child Hannah. So H-A-N-N-A-H. Uh, but then it's like, it's in their language. And the argument that the book makes is that it, language is something that shapes our worldview. It's how we see the world. And so if you learn a new language, you see the world in a different way. And in this case, it, these are like transcendent deity type uh, beings. And if you learn their language, then you have a higher or a transcendent way of seeing the world and getting outside of you know, linear time and seeing it, um, I guess, more teleologically, you could say. Uh -huh. And so I'm just wondering, like, in light of what we were saying, like, can we tell, how, how can we tell stories in this way? And then the other thing I want to lean upon is uh, a few icons, because I'm, I'm really fascinated with icons in that, let me just pull up one, if I can, is that um, they don't, they don't make a whole lot of sense. Let me zoom on. They don't make sense? Well, make okay, so like from a modern person's point of view, so like you look at this picture <laughs> of the resurrection, right? And, yeah, you know, a picture is supposed to be like a snapshot, right? And it's, it's a snapshot of what's happening right then in that moment of history. Um, and when I look at this icon, that is not happening, like not even close. No, yeah. that's not how icons work at all. Like they don't work as snapshots for sure. So like, for example, and I'll let you take it from here because you're the icon carver and can add a whole lot more to this. But like, and I apologize for the blurry image, but I wanted to get this image because at the very bottom, it has this like chained figure down here, which is pretty cool. Yep. And then on the right and left, you have an old Adam and Eve coming out of a grave. But then you have like king figures of like what Solomon you have a shepherd over here. Yeah, David, David and Solomon usually. Yeah, and then John the Baptist and then like prophet figures or maybe this is, you know, Abraham. Anyway, I'll, my point is that um, these things are happening across thousands of years of history if we approach it that mm -hmm. way. So like, can you help a modern person out and understand <laughs> what is like the purpose of this art form and what what is the the art trying to communicate okay so you are you have to understand the icons as being um it really is it's a language and so it's a language and it's a it's very much like scripture so stories fit into each other and then refer to each other um all of this is going on so you can understand this image an image of the anastasis although it's based narratively on the gospel of Nicodemus, which describes Christ going down into Hades. Uh, it also is something like that, which is secretly happening during the crucifixion. And so on, if you look at a crucifixion image, you see Christ on the cross. And then at the bottom of the cross, there's a cave. And in that cave, there's a skull and the blood of Christ is flowing down the cross and is going on to the skull of Adam, which is in that cave. Okay. So you can imagine that this image, the Anastasis, is a close up of what's going on in that little image in the crucifixion, right? Of Christ saving the, the dead Adam. Okay. Um, That's interesting. So it's so, almost like a, 
like a nested fractal or something. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. It is very much a nested fractal. So within so, one tiny portion of that other image you're describing of the crucifixion, if you were to like zoom in and expand out, it would be this. It'd be that. And so okay. what I've tried to explain to people is that in the very icon of Christ, so just Christ blessing and holding a book, there's basically all of iconography is compressed into that one icon if you if you are able to, to read it properly. And so and then you 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 kind of expand out of the image of Christ into all these different aspects of Christ and all these different aspects of iconography. Um, and so this is what's also happening in the icon itself. So now this icon is also doing what I'm telling you. So Christ comes down and he pulls Adam and Eve out of their grave. And in pulling Adam and Eve out of their, their grave, he's pulling man out of his grave. Man with a capital M, humankind. Okay, okay. okay. And so, so in that gesture, he's gathering into Adam and Eve, you could say, all the people that are standing next to Adam and Eve now. That is, he's not just saving Adam and Eve, but we show him saving Adam and Eve because they're the father and mother of all of us. He's gathering all those other people in with him. And so he has, so basically in Adam and Eve, as they're being brought out of death, is, is also King David and King Solomon and St. John the Foreigner and the, the, the person you see with the, um, with the, the crook is mm -hmm. Abel, right? So the first person to mm. die, basically, okay? Uh, and then the two, I don't know. Like, I'd have to see. It's hard to tell. But usually, like you said, it could be prophets. So you'd have the prophets and the kings. And then you have the, the first person to die, who is Abel, and the last person to die. Who is Saint John oh. the Baptist? Yeah, yeah, wow. Right, so obviously there are other people died, with, but in terms of narrative, right? You have the person that died just before Christ and was calling to Christ, and the first person that died in the story of mankind. So you can understand that all of this is being gathered into Adam and Eve as Christ is bringing them out of death. Does that make sense? That's. I mean, there, it's there, it's there would be different ways of. So there could be different ways of representing it. You don't always have exactly the same figures in uh, in Hades as he's as Adam and Eve are being taken, but you know usually it's it's some version. Oh, that's right. Of that, right? And yeah. so and and then in terms of the structure, it basically has a basic structure of a basic structure of the image of everything. So at the top of the image, you have you have the glory of Christ and Christ in His glory, kind of moving up. At the bottom, you have darkness and death, and you have death, which is chained at the bottom of, of the death as an as a, let's say, imaged as a person who's down there at the bottom. Um, and then you have the residues of technology and the residues of civilization, which are all those little white squiggles that you see. Those okay. are all bolts and, and springs and things that hold the, the, the door of death. Um, that hold the door of death together. Oh, there you go. That's a much better version. Yeah. So I pulled this one up, a much better version. But see, the like you mentioned, the bottom is different. You don't have death chained up. Yeah. Uh, you have two figures down there. So here you would have, so you would have, uh, so sometimes it's, sometimes it's death. Sometimes it's the notion of death and Hades almost has two different figures. So you have the God of death and death. And sometimes it's like death and the devil. So it depends on the versions of the icon that are chained up. And so all these little squiggles, you see the white squiggles? Yeah. Those yeah, are yeah. springs and bolts and things from the doors of hell that <sighs> Christ has broken to go into hell. Cool. So the, the things that are under his feet, like these, these, uh, these wooden panels that are there, sometimes they make a cross under his feet and sometimes they're down at the bottom of the image. Right, those are the right. doors. They're the doors of hell, which I've smashed. So, so the doors of hell that are smashed are important because what's happening on the cross, right? What's happening? One of the things that's happening on the cross is that the veil of the temple is being ripped. And so Christ at the same time is ripping the veil of the temple and is smashing the doors of hell at the same time. So he's moving into the both extremes simultaneously, going into the Holy of Holies and then going down into the pit simultaneously. And so all these images are important because they, you have to understand that they're kind of playing on each other and they're reflecting each other. Yeah. And to that extent, it, 
the way that you described that it's similar to what I was noticing with the gospels as a written literature where like they, they write it in a way where they expect the reader to know the end from the beginning. Like they under, like there's no surprise. Yeah. So like, there's no surprises. (laughs) So that's why like in the gospel of Luke, I was reading very early and it's like, Oh, he said that because of his death. (laughs) And And so in that way, it's like, I look at this icon and I'm thinking, you know, like, it's telling the whole picture and it's not just a picture of time or a, a timeline of history, but of meaning and themes. And it's like trying to pack as much in to one single frame as simply as possible. And it's really, it's just one version. It's, you could say it like a lot of the icons, the more successful icons, they're basically this idea of this image of everything where they they tend to contain all of reality in them depending on the frame of what they're talking about like one version of a whole a whole pattern of being in the one icon uh just pointed slightly in a different direction depending on what aspect you're you're emphasizing so that's the the image of the anastasis that's why it's so sad it's how can i say this looking at that image is extremely satisfactory it gives you a strange sense of wonder and peace you know I've, I've had a lot of people tell me this is their favorite icons and i the funniest thing has been to have like protestant ministers that i that i respect quite a bit tell me like this is their favorite icon and me thinking like that's amazing because this is definitely not in scripture like this is not a this is yeah, a, this is yeah. A, an icon which is based on an apocryphal text but the truth of it is oh, so strong uh yeah. that it that it kind of shines through you know yeah no doubt i mean it's like he's pillaging Hades, right? I mean, it, this is like, yep. this is like cooler than any Marvel superhero. Like he's- And yeah, this is, ep- it's like an epic, you can, <laughs> if you try to imagine it as like an animation, it's like yeah, Christ going yeah. down, you know, bringing people up and like a, you know, like a rocket going out of, he's going up. Blasting of, the hinges off yeah, exactly. the doors just of just death and chaining all the demons and yeah. <laughs> well, you know, do you know, by the way, that Mel Gibson is doing the sequel to The Passion supposedly, and it's oh, going to be- no. The set the day in Hades, oh, the entire movie. Man, that, oh yeah, okay. Well, he has his work cut out for him. I'm I'm a super critic when it comes to biblical renditions of uh, the text in the Bible carried yeah. out in film. Um, however, I'll watch that. I'll watch that. I'll, I'm gonna watch that. Heck yeah! <laughs> but then you know, um, Logos made flesh. Uh, he had an awesome video mm-hmm. essay where he argued that Apocalypto was the follow-up to the passion of the Christ. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so that's interesting because it was told through what, what was it like a central American uh, village whenever the Spaniards arrived, you know, so yeah, like a totally is an different time, story. but he, he makes a strong argument, did a heck of a job laying out like, no, this is Apocalypto. This is revelation. This yeah. is, you know, Anyway, I agree. So, I think definitely that apocalypse. I mean, just the term, just the name apocalypto. It's it's actually the name's kind of weird. It's it, it, it's kind of it, there's something weird about that name, but it, it's like it's clearly about the end of a world. Like that's uh, that's what it is, and it's it says right at the outset, right, just with the Gibbons quote by Gibbons at the at the beginning, and then it ends with you know basically then the South Americans shaking the hands of the you know, of the Spanish, which is, or like meeting the Spanish. And it's like, that's it. Your world is over. And you don't mm-hmm. know yet that it's over, but it is for a lot of reasons. And, and, and a lot of people have said that, I don't think that he, I don't think that Gibson particularly portrays the Spanish as heroic in any way. It's just almost like a matter of fact, like you've just come to the end of a, of a world and you're seeing, you're seeing a decadent kind of degenerate broken world. And then you see this unforeseen thing that comes, right? The, the rock that comes out of the uncut mountain that you find in the story of Daniel that, that comes just comes barreling down and shatters the statue. Mm-hmm. Um, I think mm-hmm. that that's definitely what that story is about. And it's a fascinating point in history because it's, it, it really is similar to what we're talking about, not just in the Bible, but with like stories like Arrival, where like the conjoining or the, the meeting of the old world with the new world was like an alien race coming to to meet the world in a lot of ways. Cause like, yeah. so I traveled on bicycle through Central America and Mexico and we stopped at any museum, any pyramid, 
type of setup that we could. And so we spent enough time with like indigenous people and some of the poorer folk, the, the farming agricultural areas. And then we went to the museum of um, uh, Cortez's castle. Yeah. Right. And it's really interesting because we step into that castle and it has suits of armor of shining steel, right. And all this weaponry. And for us, we had spent enough time with folk that were close to the earth and the land, similar to Apoc uh, Apocalypto. And so when we stepped in there, it was like shocking. It was completely shocking to see this. We're like, oh man. So we got like this tiny taste of what it must have been like for like in the last scene in that movie, whenever the indigenous people looked upon the ships and the shining steel for the first time. It must yeah. have been like whenever the humans saw the heptapods for the first time in arrival. Like this, yeah, this this thing that is completely you know, beyond our horizon. But we we also, but we have to be careful. Like we really have to be careful um, and to understand it properly. For example, like there's something to me in the arrival, which is very disturbing. Like there's something about mm, yeah. interaction with the alien race, which is, which is disturbing. Um, also because this, this, there's an ambiguity about the strain because in a way it is the limit of your, of your world, but it, it really can be the end of your world. It's not. So the idea I've talked about this in the, in a few, I've, even in the most recent article I've written for the God's dog project, I talk about this idea of the alien as that's why the alien is represented either as an angel or a demon ultimately in, in story form, mm -hmm. right? The, the extraterrestrial is either the superior being that's going to bring to us some, some uh, like it's going to judge us is going to bring some higher world, or it's the, the one that's going to eat your brains. It's the monster that comes to devour you. And there's the weird obsession with, the alien right now. And it's, to me, it's very suspicious. Like there's something suspicious, even in Arrival, I, there was something that was making me uneasy about, about the, because the, the representation of, well, the, because the representation of the aliens were really, um, the use of like the squid kind of imagery, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the monsters, the, let's say the aliens didn't appear as, they appeared as completely strange and other. And I don't know, there was something about it, which to me was, I made me, made me wonder, it was like a kind of story of fallen angels or, right? Cause you, you read in, so this is the question, right? The angels in Genesis that wanted to teach people science and skills and stuff, would there be a way to see that story from another point of view? Like, could you think that they came to help us which is like the Luciferian position, you could say, right? That basically they're there to help us, but ultimately they they bring us this weird technical knowledge that ends up destroying us, you know? Yeah. You so see I, that, like in Aronofsky's Noah, he tries to represent the Nephilim as try as good, mm -hmm. right? That they came to teach these humans all these skills, and ultimately the humans were like turned against them, and the Nephilim went ended up trying to redeem themselves by helping Noah or whatever. It, but it's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous, I don't know, I find it to be a dangerous symbol because I see people obsessed with aliens, like extraterrestrials. And I mm -hmm. see them portraying them in these kind of angelic, in this weird angelic language. Mm -hmm. And I saw that in Arrival and it, it kind of, it freaked me out a little bit. <laughs> no, I, I, welcome, I welcome that because I feel like I've been on the edge of that uh, yeah. in, in studying it. It's been fascinating because this movie has attracted me similar to, similar to an icon, as you've been describing it, where it's like they tell the story, they tell you the ending at the first scene, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they try to present it in iconographically as best as they possibly can, where they give you the whole picture. And it's not like in our modern, well, how do you say it? Like uh, literal linear one step at a time type of plot sequence. And mm -hmm. so I find that fascinating. They're using like more of an ancient form of storytelling to present the story, first of all. And then it's interesting because I think what they're trying to do, at least the script writer, I think what he was trying to do is he's trying to leverage people's attention with aliens to try to communicate 
ancient stories, particularly biblical stories. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's always that, I call it the Seraphim Rose UFO contingency, where it's like, no matter how good you try to do that, there's always this like, nope, UFOs, aliens, they are demonic. They're trying to <laughs> grab information from heaven and draw it down and confuse humans. And fair enough. Because like, yeah, I'll spend time and I'll so look at in this in the arrival story. In, in the yeah. arrival story, one of the things that's important is. So it doesn't let's say let's say you imagine you go Moses goes up the mountain. Right. And so the way that the best way to understand is that Moses goes up the mountain mystically and then reaches mystical union with God and then comes to a point where he sees God face to face and then he receives the pattern. Like this is at least how it's represented in St. Gregory of Nyssa. He receives the pattern of the tabernacle and receives the law. But you can almost understand that receiving the law and receiving the pattern of the tabernacle is related to his mystical insight. It's not separated. It's not like it's not like Moses was a stenographer that like went up the hill and jotted down like what God was saying. Right? That's uh, not it. Uh, At least not in the, the the Christian mystical understanding. Moses went up the mountain, had a mystical transformation into the unit into unity with God, and in that unity with God, he was able to receive the pattern and then bring it down to the people through the laws. And so, mm -hmm. so that's a movement from insight into representation, right? So it's like that's how you move down the mountain. So the way it's represented in arrival, it's represented as confusion and translation of the form into the so that's what happens at the edge so it's like if i encounter different strangers then i have to trans i have to like it's like a it's like a mode of confusion where i have to match my language to theirs and try to find a way to connect in order for us to be able to communicate but at least my understanding of a mystical transformation is that it it's moving into pure and pure insight in a, in a place where language doesn't ultimately matter, where it's like a pure spark. And then that spark gets, gets brought down mm. to, to, to be translated. And so uh, like some of the rabbis, for example, they have this idea that the, because at first, the first law is written by the finger of God, right? Directly onto the stone. And, and there's a sense, and Moses comes down and shatters those stones. So some of the rabbis say something like that's because Moses wasn't able to, the, it was too high. It was a too high a pattern and he couldn't connect down to mm -hmm. the world. So mm -hmm. those stones couldn't make it down to the bottom of the mountain. So then Moses has to write it himself in the second version. Right. He inscribes right. the stones himself and those he brings down and are kind of able to. So you can see like it's more about insight and communication than I think about translation in the way that it's represented in arrival at least that's my that was my insight when i was watching that movie yeah you know i i actually i think your insights are pretty good and they're actually helping me understand the movie better um <laughs> rather than be more critical towards it <laughs> but like for example like her argument is that um we can't take a scientific approach right like we can't start with ian's approach because we can't calculate our way into connecting with them. Mm -hmm. It has to be at the relational and personal uh, level first. And that's our point of contact. And in order to do that, we have to, we have to learn their language. We have to communicate. And so and there, but the, even in like, I, let me say one more thing about sure. arrival. Like, so there's a sense in which let's say you go up the mountain, right? So Moses goes up the mountain. And in going up the mountain, he, he moves up these ontological levels. He comes to a point where the encounter he has is one with his own heart. Like it's the, the, the separation between the insight he has within him and the insight that is appearing to him, let's say, in the heavens is connected. And so mm -hmm. when that happens, there's no doubt about what's going on, you could say. Whereas when you meet a stranger, so like, one of the things that isn't addressed, in my opinion, in the arrival thing, maybe it is a little bit, but it is actually, it is because the whole time, the question is, what is their intention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's your purpose when, on earth? Like That's when something question. arrived from the margins like this, then, then you don't know what the intention is. Like, is, do they actually want to destroy us? Do they mm -hmm. want to help us? 
how do we know? Mm -hmm. right? you, it's not easy to know that because it's a it's at a horizontal level. It's not like something. So yeah. yeah. So anyway, so 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 like you have to translate their language, but the translation of the language in theory doesn't necessarily make you trust someone just because you translate their language. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. So but you see that you try to like connect with them in a more. It's like a weird kind of more personal way or there's some kind of connection bond that happens between her and them in order for her to to then feel like she trusts their intentions mm -hmm. but of course us we watch the movie and we almost know like we know that they're the good that they're good because mm -hmm. there's something about the movie which is telling us that mm -hmm. um, but it's not it, if you kind of place yourself within the narrative it's not obvious mm -hmm. yeah so i i i think there is a strong argument that these could be, um, how'd you say it, like demonic or negative forces that are confusing humans. Like I acknowledge that you could totally see it that way, but I also see that there's a, a useful edifying process with trying to approach the story in a way that, at least for me personally, has allowed me to have deeper insights into say like the biblical narratives. Yeah. Um, and then also understand the power of language. Like for example, like your brother's book, I feel like this movie has really complemented and lifted up your brother's book with language of creation. Mm -hmm. Where like, because I'm studying this movie and in the context of your brother's book and the, the Genesis story and how the Bible is communicated, it's amazing. Like I now am understanding or can have eyes to see the power of language and what that yeah. does. Um, there is a sense, like there is a sense which is true, which is the idea that if you were to learn the language of angels, right? So you have this idea of the language of angels, which Paul St. Paul talks about. You know, although he says, like, you know, it's like I'd rather have love than the language of angels, but there's still the notion that there is such a thing as the language of the angels. And so there's a sense in which if you had the language of the angels, then you would you would transcend time. And there's a manner in which understanding the deeper patterns of reality is a way to transcend time because you're able to see the world from far away. And then all of a sudden, it's like you can know, you can see the pattern before or while it's happening. And you can see it here and you can see it there. And so in a certain manner, you can understand how, how these, the pattern connects things together. So you are not a slave to time as much. You're not as much a someone who just kind of experiences things and never knows what's going on. You're just kind of a slave to the process. But rather, if you learn the language of angels, then you, you kind of lift yourself above, not yourself, but you're lifted above the, the phenomena and you're able to perceive it in a more, uh, in a bigger way. And so, for example, the insights that, that I was telling you about iconography is something of a, an initiation into the language of angels where you mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. how these patterns stack up. And then all of a sudden you can look back and you see them multiply and, and play out in time and in space, but that mm -hmm. you, yeah. so, so in a way, yeah. maybe that's yeah. one of the things that arrival is trying to, in my opinion, in my opinion, a little awkwardly, but like in a, in, a, in like in a way, and that's kind of like a scientific way, a kind of science fiction version trying to help people say mm -hmm. that, like you said, if you were able to have certain insight into a higher language, then you could experience the connections of between of, of time in a different way. Like you mm -hmm. wouldn't, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be stuck in a, in a linearity in a boring, like, like in a very one, one dimensional linearity that we, we tend to, to be in. Mm -hmm. The other cool theme is that you have her as a linguist, which in a way would be like the religious worldview, as in like understanding the, the cosmos or the universe in forms of meaning as it's presented to us. And then you, then you have Ian, who is like the physicist, the scientific worldview. And what's really cool, and your brother does this in his, in his book beautifully in Language of Creation, where you start out and he, he describes the opposition, just like in the movie, you know, it's like he's reading her book and he's like making fun of it. And she's like snarking back. And so they start out like, you know, butting heads. But then over the course of the, the movie, um, learning this uh, angelic language, you could say, allows them to have some form of union or even uh, communion, where 
the the two opposites suddenly find a way to complement each other. And it's her revelation that allows him to calculate. And then he finds the patterns that leads to her further revelation. And then finally, they get to this deeper place together that um, answers the big question, what's your purpose on earth and allows them to, to save the day and bring the movie to a close. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think definitely that's what's, that's what's going on. I think it's, I think that I'm probably more on the stair from Rose camp. Okay. In well, a hopefully certain by the way, time I finish these essays, I'll uh, yeah, drag I'll you from that side to the other. <laughs> to the other side? Well, the reason why is it's also because of what's going on with the psychedelics. Like, I think that's part of it, is that a lot of these stories, they're exploring something which, which is actually happening, happening rather in the world of, of, of psychedelics. And so mm, we mm. have stories about these, these physical encounter with these, extraterrestrial beings and obviously that's not gonna i mean maybe it's gonna happen i don't know but it, it certainly hasn't happened on a mass scale yet but there's a sense in which there's a connection between that and people that are doing these hallucinogens and are encountering these beings and are communicating with them and then bringing back some supposedly some insight from that encounter um and so i that's one of the reasons why I, one another reason why I'm a little worried about these types of stories is 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 also because it's the same. Just because there's a strange being that presents itself to you, no matter what, where, and how that happens, the intention of that being is not will not be clear to you. And you know, and translating their message doesn't mean. And even if it gives you some like weird insight sometimes about about some aspects of reality that it's not necessarily always for your own good, let's say. So that's mm -hmm. why I like the mm -hmm. story of Enoch is, that's why I keep bringing back to the book of Enoch these days, just because it, I think it's an important, it's an important warning about. It's like a cautionary tale. The time when that, when that happened, let's say, when people started having these encounters with these strange beings. Mm -hmm. So let me share one more image. Uh, so this is the one that I used for the symbolism of the burning bush article on the Symbolic World blog. Mm. Um, and it just really fascinates me because you have the Theotokos as the burning bush on Mount Sinai and Moses at different stages in his Exodus story. Yeah. And, and so it's like, it's really, it's, it's again, it's like a, for a modern linear time thinker, it's like so confusing <laughs> because you have Moses, three Moseses. Like yeah. at different stages of his story within the Exodus numbers, Deuteronomy uh, storyline. And then you have the mother of God in, you know, the gospels times. Right. And then she's on Mount Sinai during Moses. And so it's like, oh my goodness, like how, what's happening here. Yeah. And there's even more than that. That's going on by the way, that maybe you don't, that you won't realize, but there's also a cave. Did you see the cave? Oh yeah. Little, okay, yeah, little cave next to Moses, and so that's also part of bringing a lot of this stuff together. You could say, and it's important also that in this version that they show the sheep, um, and the and the waters that are down there below as well. Uh -huh. Um, and so the, the this image is is a very it's very powerful because it's trying to bring together the different elements of the mountain. It's it is again like a very much a cosmic image, which is showing us you. Showing you the basic pattern of reality, using the story of Moses to do so, um, and then showing you different aspects of what's going on. So, you know, the three, you can see the three, the three moments of Moses. One is he is seeing the vision of the burning bush. The other is he's removing his sandals. And then the third is he's receiving the law from mm -hmm. God. So those, like you said, those moments are not at all at the same time. Right, Moses sees the burning bush before you know, like before yeah, like he, Exodus he, three, you know, before he goes to, to to Egypt and then you know has brings the people outside out of Egypt, and so mm -hmm. you think like, what is the relationship between the two? And you could say that there it's a repetition of these different instances of trying to tell you what this is about, uh, but just it's showing you like how at the different moments these are the same types of things that are going on, so you can understand what. Is ultimately happening, and that's why. And then the image of the mother of God herself with in the burning bush is kind of the culmination of what is going on. So you have 
the mother of God as the mountain, you could say, the mother of God as the throne, the mother of God as the bush that doesn't burn, the, the support, all of that. And then you have the revelation, which happens in the midst of that. So you have Christ, which is revealing the, the logos in, in, the, the, in the mother, just like Christ was born in the dark cave, which is all, honestly why I think the cave is there. Uh, it's to refer to the nativity, actually. Um, and then that like revelation is ultimately, so what do, what do you need for you to, to access that revelation? You need to remove your garments of skin. You need to remove your sandals. You need, and, and, and her there at the top, she's also the altar in the church. She's also the, the holy of holies in the, of the tabernacle. All of these images are coming together into one. She is, she is the pattern of the tabernacle. She is the space in which the glory of God descends. She is the, 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 the holiest place in the church as well. So this image is all bringing that all together. And that is where the law comes from. Hmm. So at the top of the mountain, Moses receives the law and then brings it down to the bottom of the mountain. And so he removes his, his sandals to go up the mountain. He comes back down the mountain with a veil on his face. So he removes the veil to go up. He puts on a veil to come down. And though this is, these are the different levels of veils in the, the temple. They're the different embodiments of, of, the, the, of the law. But they're also ultimately something like the very body of Christ. They're all the saints, all the, St. Gregory of Nisa, when he talks about the, the pillar, the, the pattern of the tabernacle that Moses gets in, the, in his insight, in his vision. He says the pillars of the of the the pillars in the tabernacle are the saints and the different elements in the tabernacle they're people. Like he's saying, ultimately, what they are is they're people. Like wow. of course, wow. in the the small instantiation you see in Israel, they're object, but ultimately they are they are the the very body of Christ. So you can understand all of that being kind of brought together into one image, where it's there to it is like like we were talking about something something like a little in trying to initiate you into the language of angels, where you're able to see across the Bible in, from the Old Testament into the church as how all of these are connected together and, and manifesting the pattern of the incarnation from, from the time of Moses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it, it seems like it's more like a telos of understanding time teleolog teleologically, whereas if you just think of it like as a hero's journey of one thing leading to the next, very linear. Um, not to say that the hero's journey as a plot outline doesn't have its utility or it's effective or uh, is it, it's has its place, but this is just a different way to me of being able to present reality in a way that's not really concerned with linear sequence. And that just fascinates me. You know, and it it's also, concerned to a certain extent. Like it's not completely. It like it won't show. You know, I mean, it is. It is. There's the contain. It's not fully wild. Like you wouldn't have. You wouldn't. It. It's. It still has a certain frame, and that frame uh, can slip and refer, but it still holds to a certain extent. So, like you wouldn't. Um. How can I say this? You know, you wouldn't. You wouldn't have, let's say, the mountain of Sinai with Moses receiving the law and, and the burning bush, and then like have an image of the new Jerusalem. Then it would just. Sh it would be too much. Like it would. It would. Mm -hmm. It would be too big. Uh, although that the symbolism would not be inappropriate. It would actually be quite appropriate. But so that so it's not complete. Doesn't completely shatter time, but it helps you see how you know that that instances of time can be brought together towards the telos the way that you're saying and that you can experience that and you can see it even in the manner in which we construct stories so some so doing it in space is makes you see how the different elements in in the frame story are actually moving towards the telos if you bring them together and you you, mo you show them geometrically as related to each other or you show some things below some things above some things to the sides you can help people see how that's what's going on in the story too right the story is doing that mm -hmm. when Christ, when when moses there's a reason why moses goes up the mountain to to, to encounter the burning bush and then goes mm -hmm. up the mountain to receive the law it's like that's actually there in the story 
you might not see it because you forgot and you're now you're too much in this part of the story mm -hmm. but if when i bring it together then i can show you mm -hmm. that's so cool if you can do it differently too like saint Ephraim the syrian does it in his poetry in ways that are just astounding mm -hmm. where like in a mm -hmm. little stanza he'll in within one one sentence like you know just one phrase He'll join two images and then two other images. And by the time you finish the stanza, you've gone from Genesis to, to Revelation. And it's all been brought together into one, uh, into one, one image. You know? Wow. Yeah. And I think about just like practically the Christian life is so informed by the future. You know, it's like eschatological. It's like um, the, the things that we do in the present are, are shaped by or expressed by things that have happened in the past, older stories. Um, but then our aim is future. It's the second arrival of Christ and what that will bring and the age to come. And so it's like, we're preparing, we're doing things uh, within the context of the future while expressing things even with past stories. So it's just interesting how even in the, the scriptures, it's, it talks about, it, the way it talks about say um, Passover, right? It's like, remember when we were in Egypt? It's like, okay, you mean when those people, our family members were in Egypt? It's like, no, remember when we were? And it's like, it's like, okay, so we're remembering the past and we're also somehow remembering the future. Yeah. I, yeah, for sure. But it's also important to understand that it's not the future in, 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 in a general sense. That is, it is the future in the sense in which the future will will accumulate all the. So it's like you're in. A, so it's it's someone like you're you're on the path towards something, and then you you know that you built on these things that you're moving, but then because you're moving in a direction, you know that the finality of that gathering will happen at the end. Right. So you're gathering elements into a story while you're in the story. But because you know you're moving in a direction, you also know that that will continue to gather until you reach the, the telos of the thing you're part of. And so that's what eschatology is. That is the future, is not just any future, it is the future in which the totality of the elements will be brought together mm -hmm. into their telos. And we know that that happens because we it happens all the time, right? It's like you, you're doing anything you're doing. It's like, you, I don't know, you decide to go to the store. Well, by, you know, before, you know, you're going to the store, you know, you're going to get things, you know, you're going to come back. And so, but you know that, that fi the finality of how that's all going to come together will only manifest once you've finished, once you've come back from the store and put the groceries on the table. Mm -hmm. And so you, so, but you can see it as you're going towards the store. You can get, you can all, you can sense it. You can, you know what, you don't know totally what's going to happen, but you can kind of, it's coming together as you're experiencing it. Uh, and that's what eschatology is, but for a cosmic, a cosmic scale. Yeah. It's, not, it's like how, it's it's like not, how St. Paul not says that. It, well, he says like, we can see dimly. It's like, we can uh, imagine or see even dimly the, the future, I guess you could say, or, um, but then we'll see clearly, you know, one day. Yeah. And that's fractally true. It's like, you know, you've got the basketball, you're going up for a layup. I mean, you can see dimly what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. you, as you're doing it, as you're coming up for the layup, you can kind of, you can perceive it like as a vague thing that you're moving into and you know, it's right. And you know, it's, it's good. It's happening. And then once it's finished, then it's like, boom, it all, has come together and now yes. you've seen it you've seen it in its totality right and then you have this you know and so it's like it's it's like that for all things we all we always experience the world that way and what saint paul is saying is basically there's a there's a giant version of that there's a giant version in which this movement we're mo we're moving towards the telos and we can see it we can kind of know that that's what we need to move towards we can see dimly the forms taking shape as we're as we're coming into them, but mm -hmm. that we know because we've seen it and we've, we've experienced it nonstop that at some, in some point, all of this is going to come together mm -hmm. and that, and that we're going to see the whole thing for, in its clarity. Well, I gotta say, um, I gotta say, this is super helpful, Jonathan. I hope it is for everybody listening too. Um, my question is, 
can you have something that's not a, an icon, like in the traditional sense or the ones that we viewed uh, during our talk? Can you have like a movie that's iconographic in the way that it presents meaning and information? Yeah, I think so. I think that you can, I mean, you can have, like let's say that one of the things we're trying to do with this graphic novel is something like, like that, where we're going to, and we're not the first people to do it. I've seen people do it already, you know, where you gather images together and you build up a language and you start to refer back. And obviously now we just have the first book, which is, which is coming out, but the other books are going to build on the visual language we, we made in the first, mm -hmm. refer back to each other, refer into each other, and then slowly build up to images that you can know what it's referring to just by seeing it. You can kind of, you, you've layered up this meaning that's been there before. So I think that that can happen in all kinds of images. I think that that's what, that's what one of the things that makes us love stories in the first place, right? That's why when you, you know, when you, let's say you, you watch a play by Shakespeare and all of a sudden it's like you're, you're seeing connecting these different elements from other, you know, from fairy stories or from, you know, you hear quotations from different, different authors. That's why people love to quote other authors. It's like, it's that experience of things coming together in a, in a, in a surprising way. I think that that's something that you can, mm -hmm. you can experience all the time. Like, I think, although in the Bible, we don't do it that way. It's not done that way, but I think like the fishtail ending is, is a way to experience the kind of surprise of teleology. You know, when you have a movie like The Sixth Sense, for example, in which that's what's being done to you. So it's like during The Sixth Sense, the things are being set out to you dimly. Like you have all these dim images which are bringing you along, but are creating as much confusion as they are clarity as you're moving towards the, the final moment. And mm -hmm. finally, when the revelation comes, you have this eschatological surprise and then everything falls together. And then even the things that you were annoyed with the movie before, like I remember the first time I saw it, there's some parts of the movie where I'm like, this is so stupid. <laughs> like, you know that part where he lifts, he like, he's listening to the radio and he, he like just puts the volume up and all of a sudden he hears the spirits and I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And the whole time I was like, well, this is so stupid. <laughs> then when it comes to the end, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like this is, then it all makes sense, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and so I think that sometimes some stories can do that through different means. Like the, 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 let's say the kind of fishtail ending is one, but there are other ways to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, Jonathan, what's your favorite movie? I don't, I don't have one. I think people <laughs> asked me this before. I really don't have a favorite movie. Uh, just because I don't, I don't see it that way. Sure, you know, it's like, yeah. I don't, I don't, the, my, my experience of, of movies is different than let's say the way that I experience scripture. Although I inform one with the other, I don't, I think that let's say when I was younger, I was definitely attached to certain characters, fictional characters. Like I really love Batman, which people would know by watching my, my videos. Cause I did, mm -hmm. I've done a lot of movies on a lot of things on Batman. And so, but I think that I'm not, I'm not there anymore. You know, I just don't, I don't have the same types of experiences. And also because I, yeah. So, so I'm afraid I, I don't, I don't have an, I don't really have an answer for you. How about, uh, movie. you know, what do you think my favorite the, movie should be? Oh man. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's see i did watch um spirited away recently uh and I, it's actually, definitely one of my favorite that's for sure okay so at least i'm, I'm not too far off the mark i i went to find your commentary because i remembered very early on in the early days i think i was subscriber like a thousand or two thousand yeah it got shut down by miyazaki's by Sue ghibli they shut oh. it down I, it's on bit shoot i have it on okay BitChute, good but it's not on uh all right I'm glad I asked because I went to go look for it. I'm like, finally, because I don't like watching the movie critiques of movies I haven't watched yet. Um, and so I watched it like years later now. And I'm like, oh, I can finally watch this Jonathan Peugeot movie critique. And uh, <laughs> couldn't find yeah, it. I put it up on I put it up on Bitchu because because uh, they basically shut it down completely. Like I, it, it just they they're pretty strict on the copyright wow. stuff. OK, um, I, maybe like what? How about just a story in general, something you've read, something you even heard or seen that's really impacted you in your life? Um, 
Okay, so maybe I could I could say like when I was young, the 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 whole Batman story really was was the one that awoke that kind of awakened me to storytelling. And so I read, I read. Um, I was thirteen. I read the I read the the Dark Knight series by Frank Miller, Dark Knight mm-hmm. Returns, and that had a huge effect on how I perceive stories because he he does this kind of broken. He does this this interesting kind of broken storytelling where he keeps showing you different places at the same time and like media and everything and it and it creates this tapestry where things kind of get pulled together. Mm. Um, and so I my I think like my storytelling was probably more influenced by comics even than by by movies. You know when I read like for example like when I read Alan Moore's Watchmen, mm-hmm. he did things with story that I was astounded by. Like he was really really did a kind of like an evil genius type things like he there's one of the issues in in um in Watchmen where it's a uh, horseshack who's got this like he's got this this uh horseshack uh patterns on his uh rorschach rorschach not horseshack rorschach patterns on his face mm-hmm. and then he the whole issue is like a mirror the way it's done it's like symmetrical the entire issue is like symmetrical so you have this symmetrical composition in the in the you have this play between different images that reflect each other it's astounding That's and then awesome. he ends the whole the whole book as a reflection of the beginning and he does this whole kind of geometric he won all these awards for the for the writing of that and so i just remember seeing like wait a minute there's a possibility of like pattern storytelling um and a kind of pattern storytelling which is almost like poetry but in visual in visual terms so I think that that he did a great job, and I think that, for example, like I was, I was, uh, I did a video on like that first Joker scene in, uh, in the the the, what is it called, Dark Dark Knight? I forget one of the Christopher Nolan movie, the second one. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And as like Dark that Knight. that little scene, like there's scenes like that where it's very powerfully done in terms of constructing the narrative in a way that reveals the the essence of the character. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. those types of things really affect me let's say i i can when i see them i'm like wow this is a a, when they're able to make the structure of the story reflect the story itself you know it is actually something Mm -hmm. that i experienced for example earlier than that like no not earlier but when i was maybe like 20 i read james joyce portrait of an artist and james joyce tries to do that all through the book and i remember being extremely impressed by how joyce is able to structure the story based on the the purpose of the characters and kind of bring it all together. Um, Hmm. I think that like in Ulysses, he does it in a way that is too obvious, almost like he he actually pulls into pattern too much. And so you actually don't care at some point anymore, like what's going on, but in, but in a portrait of a portrait of an artist as a young man, he does it in a way that is very, it's, it's quite powerful. Hmm. So, so the moderns actually have, they had that desire to, to do that too. And so it's not completely, they make it a little, maybe sometimes they make it more explicit. And so then you can go back and you can notice how it was like that in older stories too. So mm-hmm. I guess that's something that happened to me when I was a teenager, reading those comics and then reading James Joyce and reading, uh, you know, even other people like Herman Hesse and, and these types of modern modern authors and then noticing that what they were doing. Hmm. Now, uh, would you say that the, the chiastic form that you described of, how Rorschach's like plot line, how it was structured was like, you know, from A to B and then B to A, right? It had this like biradial type of layout. Um, have you recognized that in scripture at all? I mean, it's, it's definitely there. And some people spend their whole lives talking about how that structure is there. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's there. I think, I think some people who have seen it there, they might, might, need a little bit of a push or a bit of an effort to to show you what it means <laughs> like mm-hmm. not just to yeah, not yeah, just yeah. to not just to show you that it's there in the structure so mm-hmm. what i've mm-hmm. a lot of the things i've seen is how they can take a psalm and and kind of decompose it in terms of its chiastic structure but at least i haven't experienced a lot of people that are able to show you how that is meaningful within the psalm it's not just a literary structure it, it should, if you're able to demonstrate that it, it's a pattern, it should, it should lay itself out in the meaning as mm-hmm, well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I haven't been super, I haven't been super attentive to that. Um, but I, I definitely think that it's, 
it definitely seems to to be there. So yeah, like there's a, st- a story that I was reading um, with David where what is it Second Samuel fourteen I believe fourteen fifteen uh, the Bathsheba story where it starts and it says King David he should be doing what kings do which is out fighting battles it's the season for military conquest but he's not he's like lapping in luxury up in his palace and his penthouse suite so to speak and doing things he shouldn't be doing and so he has a fall but then so from the start of that to the end of this the two chapters later it ends with him going out to battle and if you see all of the plot sequences leading up to his repentance right his seven days of crying and weeping and and interceding for his sick child um then the same plots happen then that mirror order all the way to the end of that second chapter where he's Mm. then going out to battle doing things that a righteous king would do yeah that's that's super interesting you see that like um there's a uh in um Chrétien de Troyes, he, he, you see that in some of his, his romances where he, he'll play the, the, the problem, let's say, of one excess and how it leads to, how can I say this? It's like, let's say the knight has to, has to balance his affection towards, like, to the lover, but then also has to balance that with the proudness in battle. And that if he doesn't, is he's not able to balance that, then he either falls one way or the other, like he'll lose his lover because he he's wants to fight all the time, you know, uh, or hmm. he'll, or he'll become weak and, and won't be able to defend his lover. If he's, you know, if he's too, if he, if he's always with her in the, in the home, like in the bedroom, let's say. So he's like trying to find that. So it's interesting that what you're saying is like, basically he goes, it really is this fall. And then it's, that's what leads him going too far in his, in his luxury is what leads him ultimately back on track to be able to be the king that, that the king of Israel, basically. So mm-hmm. yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, so Jonathan, I, and we're kind of ending to the, we're, we're arriving at the end of our conversation. I just had like a few more questions regarding, I guess, building out that dictionary for the symbolic world. Sure. Or symbolic language. So last time I asked you on love and logos, this time I really, I, you can answer in a couple words or I don't know, a couple minutes. I'll leave it up to you, but I'm really curious and need some clarity on the word mythos. Like what is mythos and how does it function with the other uh, principles of reality, like logos and love? Well, it's not, I mean, mythos is not, it's not a, it's not a biblical, it's not a Christian term really. It's like, a, it's, I don't even know where that, where that, I think, I think that, it's there in Plato because Plato differentiates logos and mythos. You see it in the uh, symposium. Like in the symposium, you actually have that where I remember the symposium when uh, Aristophanes is asked to give like uh, a description of the origin of the, of the world. Aristophanes says, should I give you a logos or a mythos? And then he gives a mythos, which is that story of the round people had round bodies, you know, that weird story about how people had at the outset had round bodies and were split in half, you know, and then they have to okay. refine their other half in order to, to, uh, to kind of join together. Um, Interesting. And so I think that in terms of, at least in terms of the way Plato seems to understand it is that the mythos is, is a story version of a, of a point of a, and, and the logos that is rather a kind of series of arguments, which will lead you to a conclusion, let's say, and so at least in Plato, that seems to be what is going on. Um, and so interestingly enough, in Christianity, those two kind of get joined together because the, the logos is incarnated in a person that has a story. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there's a sense in which the, that's why, you know, the famous uh, phrase by C.S. Lewis, right, the idea of the, the, the true myth, let's say, of the myth, which is also true in the way that you know, a more critical or logical or step-by-step approach would also lead you to, to seeing truth. Um, and so maybe at least if you want to oppose logos and mythos, that's probably the best way to, to, uh, to understand it. Yeah. Cause I, I think of logos as what, like a, an organizing principle or the principle that um, allows you to have a multiplicity of identities. Uh, and then with mythos or myth, I just feel like it's so like I have to retrain my brain of how to understand that because my whole life in this modern world, it's been 
you know, myth busters. I grew up watching science fiction, or excuse me, scientists who are, what were those two guys? They were um, stunt, they were stunt guys. And they were just busting myths. And mm-hmm. As if to say that myth is something that is tra-la-la, it's like make-believe. Yeah. And so uh, like from your definition to at least the functional modern definition, it seems like we're talking about two totally different things. Or well, Plato didn't. Plato, in if you read in the symposium, for example, like Plato really is making fun of Aristophanes. By the way, when, when he has Aristophanes give that story of the of the round bodies and separated into two that kind of join together, it's clear that he doesn't like Aristophanes and is really kind of mocking him, hmm. uh, which is hilarious because that that story <laughs> yeah. has become the foundation for a lot of weird stuff today, like a lot of weird, uh, like a new myth for a lot of the the weird weirdness in the world right now. But anyways. That's a digression. Um, so, but but I think I, I I think that going back into scripture and understanding that these are the stories, like these stories embody these principles. You can't avoid it because there isn't a lot of that type of there isn't a lot of that type of step by step argumentation that you would find, or step by step logical process that you would find in a in a in a Socratic dialogue, like in a Socratic discussion. You don't have a lot of that in the Bible. It really is this. Kind of embodied story form so mm-hmm. so i mean i get it but it's just it's i think that it really is an assault by the by the reasonable and an assault by the kind of enlightenment project on any kind of storytelling mm. um, and that's really that's actually a place where postmodernism is useful because one of the things that the postmoderns have done is like even derrida one of the things he would do all the time would be to go into plato's to go into Plato and then to tell you all the stories that he's got in there hmm. to show you how Plato is constantly storytelling, even though he, he tends to, he also says that he doesn't like storytelling, that it's, it's dangerous and it's off, but he's constantly doing it and that there's an ine- inevitability of storytelling and that you see it like it, that's kind of what I'm pointing out to when I say something like, you know, when Brett Weinstein says it's a higher truth, it's like you're not you're in a, you're in the story world, my friend. You're in the myth world when you when you start using geographical yeah. markers to talk about your ideas. Then you're then you've lost the plot in terms of pure pure rational deduction steps. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so but you can't avoid it because it's actually it's part of the world. It's 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 part of reality, and yeah. so ultimately you need those two to kind of join together into. Mm-hmm. So like with Brett Weinstein, he confuses me because one of his Q and A's, I think 23, something like that. At the end, he admitted, he said that what we're lacking is, is narrative and story to unify us and that we can't approach this with logic or, or science. It, it would take too long. Mm. Right. And so it's like, not too bad coming from an evolutionary biologist, you know? Um, yeah. But I think he's made, I think he's made his, he's made some steps, like interesting steps. I had a private discussion with him uh, like a few weeks ago, okay. maybe like a, a month and a half ago. Huh. And it was very positive. It was actually super positive. And, mm. and I felt like he really understood what I was talking about. Um, and we we're supposed to do a public discussion. It's just that his schedule just hasn't made it possible yet. Okay. So it'll be interesting to see like how that goes. And it's the same, you see, like even a lot of the, even those that are more knee jerk, you see it in Sam Harris where he's super knee jerk against religion but then he'll say things that are so conducive basically it's like you're right at the doorstep um so i don't know so i don't know if it's if it's a if it's people having an inkling of something more or if it's just like an internal contradiction in their in their in their own system i don't know mm-hmm. yeah i so where did where does it go where where myth or mythos is is i mean it's 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 not like inherently a positive thing. I just think of like, say like the tyrannical orders, right? It's a chaotic time. And then all of a sudden someone comes with a, a unifying story that people yeah. can act out and live and be a part of, you know? It's like, you look at Nazi Germany, they were looking for something to bring back the pride of being a people again. Yeah. And so it was like this, this hole, this shape that was waiting to be filled by some type of mythos if I'm understanding how you're you're laying it out. Um, and that's what the Nazi party was able to provide. Yeah, and you're right. And the, the same with the communist uh, revolution was steeped in, in mythological language. 
you know, of the of the of the underlings of everything below rising up, the monster, sea monster coming up and taking, and you know the. So it was it was kind of almost like two opposite stories. One was this idea of the pure identity, which was at the top of the mountain with the sword, you know, kind of mastering the world. And the other was about the mass, you know, the oppressed mass and the oppressed people that are below that have to kind of rise up and and um, and take the the power. And so. In, in, let's say, the misuse of mythos, we can also see how you have to balance it out. You have to have a story which, is, which tends to include enough aspects for the world to be able to exist in it. If you create stories that, that don't have room for all, you know, and don't leave room for all these things to kind of find their place, then, mm-hmm. then you're just building up towards catastrophe all the time. Mm-hmm. And we never really are able to... I've never really able to completely do it, you know, but some, some moments and some, uh, let's say some versions have been better than others. Mm-hmm. And it's hard because moderns don't think that way. We don't think we don't like one of the things, for example, is like, we think that everything has to be explicit and we don't think that some things can just left to be implicit mm-hmm. and just not mm-hmm. talked about. And mm-hmm. that by leaving them implicit, what we're actually doing is we're leaving room for them to exist in an in a in a in a less formed and implicit way, but it's but it's like you can see it in. Uh... Okay, so I'll give you I'll give you a, a really funny example, you know, uh, which uh, which he might be angry that I'm bringing it up, but I had a discussion with Alexander Bard recently, uh, and he's like a Swedish philosopher, and he he had this theory which is that in ancient worlds. The initiates, those that were initiated, one part of their initiation was to understand that all this religion stuff is BS. And that it's all really just, it's it's all BS. And they're initiated and they become the leaders and then they're kind of above the system. And they enact the BS for the people, but they know that it's BS and that it's not true. And I was thinking, first of all, obviously I don't agree with it, but I was saying, even if I did agree with you, you don't believe that. Because if you believed it, you would shut up about it, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that yeah. means that you don't even believe what you're saying. Because if you believed it, you wouldn't be telling us that. You would let it exist as an implicit structure that is not made public. But because you're trying to make it public, it means that you either you don't believe in it or you want to destroy the world. It's like which, which one of those two is true, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there are things that we don't say that are just there implicit that, that, that we don't, that if we bring, even bringing them into, into the light is in a manner, a way of, I mean, ultimately it's going to happen. Christ told us it's going to happen, right? It is mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the end, all of these things are going to come to light and it's all going to happen, but it, you have to understand what that means. Like you have to understand that usually like you kind of have to, in most systems, in most ways of, existing there's some things which remain unsaid for a reason and that that's how actually mm. how they participate in the story is by mm. being unsaid and that's fine sometimes you know but that's really hard for moderns to think that way oh yeah because we're so obsessed with calculating and expressing everything uh you know a modern story that i could think of as an example would be the life of pi where the life of Pi, you know, he lays out the story with the animals and the boy on the boat and then stopping at that weird island and then eventually making it back to the mainland. And then at the end in the book and the movie, it's like it lays out that a story that is logical, like a logical version of the story, which is, OK, so it wasn't the animals. It was these other humans, these people. the mom, the people, the butcher. Yeah the you know all these different figures were in the boat right and then he and he kind of leaves it with this like in like two stories one in each hand and one's like which one do you like you know do you like the one with the the zebra and the orangutan and the tiger or do you like the one with the people yeah and then, and then you're like oh so this story is just about cannibalism all right great but a wonderful story. yeah so <laughs> That's yeah. your insight. It's all it's all about cannibalism. All right, dude. Yeah. So the <laughs> sorry. No, trust me. There's there's parts of that story leaves me wanting just to say it nicely. Um, yeah. But I think just to bring up that dynamic of mythos and logos, it's like 
interesting how he he explicated it. He's he said it out loud. He's like, okay, so do you want the the mythos? Do you want the story of it, or did you want the you know the reason, logical details? Yeah. Everything's technically true in uh, in in that form of the sense. And like, it, am I reading that correctly? As an example? you're right, but the, the, you have to understand that. How can I say this? It's like there's a manner in which Jesus does that sometimes too. How so? Jesus does that too. Jesus sometimes, and it's mysterious. Like he he he'll tell a story and then he'll reveal the secret to his disciples. And yeah, then like the parable of the reveals, sower. Yeah, so yeah. he lays out the parable of the sower, he tells yeah. a story, and then the rest of the chapter is the disciples asking him to explain it, spill it out for him. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's interesting in the way that he explained it, I think, is at least in, in Christ, there's another mystery. There's like a, a layered mystery where he's explaining it, but he's not, he's opening up, he's opening up a, a mystery too. Like it's not, it's not, mm -hmm. it's like if you say some, if like if by explaining it, you say something like the word of God, which falls into the, into the heart and then it's like oh you think most people are going to understand that no yeah, it's well, what is that layer mean? of story <laughs> it's going to be just another layer of story yeah, how does that people, work you know and so exactly yeah yeah all right well <laughs> <laughs> why don't we eat, why don't we uh leave it there where some things are just better left unsaid jonathan <laughs> that's right maybe all right uh jonathan it's right, good to talk to you derek yeah any other announcements i don't know i mean what, what else do i'm sure there are on? plenty of there's a lot of things going on, you know, I don't know, uh, like, for sure this year, this year, in theory, I'm going to, I'm going to try to write a book this year. That's going to be, that's going to be the big thing. What kind of book? And so we'll see. I haven't totally decided yet. It's going to be gonna Mythos be, or Logos. Yeah, that's actually a good, but it's going to, it's mostly going to be either a more technical book, like in terms of defending my positions with the church fathers and trying to explain, you know, how, what I'm saying connects more closely to to uh to christian theology or the other will be maybe would be a more popular book which would be a kind of you know symbolism 101 you know the book that the book that you're that you somebody wants to know about symbolism and you can just say well you know read this it's not so hard to understand mm, okay so yeah, something well, like that but i'm not sure yet both those would be super helpful so yeah yeah i look forward to that uh, how about god's dog when can we like hold the copy in our hands Man, yeah, that's been a pain. It's just the logistics, you know, making a book and then hitting the logistics aspect of it has been harder. Like I've just been fighting with these shipping companies just to get them to send me prices and to, to set everything up. Like we, it took us almost a month to get the money because Indiegogo kept saying some, there's some problem with like, it wasn't the right type of account, which was not spelled out at the outset. It's like, it's not the right type of account. You need this type of account. And then you, change it. And then they're like, well, actually, no, there's still something that you need. So you end up like using three different accounts. Anyways, it's nuts. So the logistics wow. of it has been very painful. And so, so I, I finally got like shipping prices from the shipping company, but it's not the right prices. They made a mistake. So I sent it back and I said, send me the right prices. And now I'm waiting for that. And then, and until I do that, there's some, I can't like do the steps until I have all that I need. So it's, it's frustrating. So, so as soon as we have like the shipping prices and everything's going to be set up, or I'm at least going to send a PDF to people uh, because because I, I I feel like I can't I can't just it's going to take another two three months before we actually physically are able to ship it so I'm just gonna I'm gonna send people PDF so at least people don't feel totally totally jipped by this because we it's all there we just have to kind of get it there get it out so we'll for the next time for like the second book we'll know in advance and with like with the money we raised with the first book I'll probably just pay for the printing as we're doing the crowdfunding so that when we're finished the crowdfunding, we're already really far ahead with like mm -hmm. the, the actual shipping and everything. And we just need the numbers in order to, to kind of, to kind of get it done. So hopefully that'll be, that'll work. Okay. Well, I look forward to it whenever, whenever it gets shipped out. Yep. Yep. Right, so I look forward to having it shipped out too. Definitely. <laughs> Thanks for the conversation, Jonathan. It's been great. Hi, right, Derek. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.